show right here on ESPN Radio, everybody. Here with you over the next hour, as I am every weekday. Number to call up, as always, is 888-729-3776, 888-SAY-ESPN. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive's Home Insurance. Get your quote at Progressive.com. Today, approximately 15 minutes or so, we'll have boxing analyst extraordinaire for ESPN, the one and only Teddy Atlas, and thereafter, at approximately 30 minutes past the hour, I will have the IBF welterweight champion of the world, Errol Spence Jr., uh, who will be fighting Lamont Peterson uh, this Saturday in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, make sure you don't miss it for the welterweight crown. I think he'll win that fight. I'll leave it at that. Looking forward to talking to Errol Spence. He's one of the superstars, you know, coming up in this sport. Is he Floyd Mayweather? Not yet. Uh, but he has that potential. Uh, Tyrone Crawford's coming. Keith Thurman's already there as the, the WBA, um, WBC champion. So we'll definitely talk about that as the show progresses today. 888-729-3776. It's 888-SAY-ESPN. But until then, we'll go back to the calls since I haven't had much time to take calls in the first hour. Let's go to my man Carlton in Tampa. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, buddy. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you doing I'm today? I'm doing great. Thank you for calling. What's up? I want to talk referees, but I want to talk NFL referees. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the uh, the crew for uh, the uh, New England game was named uh, for, for, for Sunday's New England game, and it's okay. Cleet Blakeman. Cleet Blakeman has refed, been the head ref of six New England games. New England is 2-4 and four when he's been on the field. So I think the NFL is hearing, uh, you know, the pressure of how the calls have gone three to one against the Patriots opponents the last four games. And they're trying to assign somebody, somebody who might have an objective bone in their body to hit up that referee group. But Tony Starator is the back judge. He's, uh, he's good old Gene Starator's older brother. And so I got to do some research on Uh-oh. on pass interference calls that he's called this year because he's going to be the guy throwing oh, the flag. Oh Lord, you're, and you're, as I you're said, doing your research to set the stage. The so when New England wins another game, another AFC Championship game, you're going to point out how it's Bill Belichick. He won't stop. He won't stop cheating. That's where you're going, Carlton. The Jacksonville Jaguars were not called called for a single defensive holding or pass interference call against the Steelers, even though Bouye and and uh, Ramsey were mugging the Steelers receivers. And I predict, I predict, Steve, A, they'll be called for at least three defensive holding or pass interference calls by Mr. Starator there. We shall see. I like the idea that Cleve ba- Blakeman is the, is the head ref, because he certainly hasn't been a, a Patriots favorite there, you know, given that they've probably lost more... When he's been the head ref than anybody else. One more point, Stephen A. Go ahead. The, the reason why Haley is gone, okay? The Steelers two most important games this year. The game against the Patriots and of course the Jacksonville. Yeah, we know that. Players. We know that they, bots call at the end. No question about that. Oh, I completely bad. botched the end of the Patriots uh, game, especially that two yard pass when they had twenty eight seconds to go and he tackled inbounds, and of course that led to the disastrous interception one play later, and and of course. Uh, Haley had had, what, six or seven minutes while they were reviewing the Jesse James call to get his offense aligned, what they were going to do on the next three plays, and he botched it. And then the two fourth down low percentage calls that they got stuck both times in, in the playoff game. Somebody had to pay for that. Now I'm just wondering when the heck is somebody on the defensive side going to pay for their wretched secondary? Because well, that's the next person. Well, that I, to, I don't think there's any question. Go. I don't think there's any question about that. But I also don't think it was because of this play. A couple of botch plays this season. The fact is, Todd Haley had been here for six years. He walked into this season in the last year of his contract, and there was speculation long before those mistakes were made that the Steelers were going to make a change. And I think it had a lot to do with his relationship, particularly with Big Ben, and obviously. Uh, you listen, this is why Fickner, Fick, Fick, Fickner, you know, has developed and cultivated a relationship with Big Ben to the point where they're going to take him from the quarterback coaching position and put him in as the offensive coordinator, primarily due to his great relationship with Big Ben. But you know what? Dirk Cutter had a great relationship with Jameis Winston to the point where they booted Lovey Smith out the door in Tampa. And look where that got them. 
Yeah. Well, you know, Roethlisberger, I, I don't know if it was Roethlisberger pointed it out or the columnist that pointed it out, uh, that he, he has been successful on 18 out of 19 one-yard quarterback sneaks in his life. Right. And he's saying, I don't know why we're not calling that That's darn right. thing. So obviously he had a problem with these darn play calls, not only that, but at the end of the Patriots game. So somebody was going to have to pay for that. Because it doesn't matter if you have the best offense in the NFL, if at the critical moments in playoff games or the Super Bowl, you lose your mind like Pete Carroll did, not giving the ball to Marshawn Lynch three times from the half-yard line. You know, so it doesn't really matter. You destroy the entire season if you can't keep your head in those moments. I got you. And And the Steelers couldn't do it this year. Thanks a lot, buddy. I appreciate the call. All good points. No question about it. I agree with you on every single point that you made. No doubt. Let's go to Byron in Maine. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead, Byron. Hi, Stephen A. Thanks for taking my call. Go ahead, buddy. I want to change uh, the pace a little bit. My my concern is not the officiating, but your opinion I would like to get on the LeBron James, Michael Jordan comparison. You hear a lot of it all the time. What I would like to see done is the people that have the films of Michael playing through his years that are matching LeBron's age and his years right now. Um, it doesn't matter to I, me. It doesn't matter to me. LeBron James, as a talent, is a freak of nature and a once-in-a-lifetime p- player. 6'9", 260, can handle the ball, uh, can pass. His basketball IQ is off the charts. He's a physical specimen. He's reliable health-wise. All of those things are true. And I would still take Jordan any day of the week and twice on Sundays because LeBron did not did not have that killer instinct. He does not have a closers mentality. He will produce for you. He will put up numbers. He will he will keep you competitive. All those things are true. But when it's really time to close the deal, that is not the person that I'm going to rely upon. And when I think about Michael Jordan, I see a closer. I see the greatest assassin that the game has ever known. No, he's not 260 pounds. No, he can't beat you the way LeBron James could beat you, but he can will you to victory. And, for example, even with the troubles and the issues that the Cleveland Cavaliers are having this year, we heard the same thing from LeBron in a, in a conference championship games. You know, after they beat Boston, he was talking about he was so stressed he didn't even want to think about it. Why? Because of, oh, look at how tough the Golden State Warriors are going to be. You didn't hear that from Michael Jordan. That's why he was 6-0 in the NBA Finals. Yeah, LeBron's talent is not into question. It's his his mentality exactly during the games or at the end of games. Exactly. You never saw Michael. I never saw Michael not play with intensity. I can see games, even the last few, against Toronto that's just been played. I see LeBron being the last Cleveland Cavaliers down the floor, not on a fast break, but just walking with his hands completely at his side. Yeah, I see a guy that was talking yesterday, basically preparing all of us for the Cleveland Cavaliers finishing the second place again. That's what I see and hear when I'm looking at LeBron James right now, a team and a player that knows they can't beat the Golden State Warriors. You'd have never seen that from Michael Jordan. You'd have never seen it. Appreciate the call, man. Thank you. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. The great one. Boxing analyst extraordinaire Teddy Atlas. He's up next with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. I'm a robot vacuum cleaner, so yeah, I got one gig. I suck up dirt, so pardon my inferiority complex about Geico, who does so much more. Like, not only could they save their customers money on car insurance, but they got fast and friendly claim service, too, and an award-winning mobile app. Plus access to licensed agents 24-7. Who am I kidding? I can't even do corners. Uh Uh-oh. Choking hazard. (gasps) Popcorn girdles. Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. 16 minutes past hour number two back here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. ESPN Radio, 250-plus markets across the United States of America, as well as on Sirius XM Channel 80. Number to call up, as always, is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. No matter what the weather is outside, you can always brighten the day with 1-800-Flowers.com. When you order a dozen multicolored roses for only twenty nine ninety nine, you'll get another dozen absolutely free. Just go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ESPN. It is always my honor and privilege to have my next guest. 
on the line with me. I love doing Sports Center with him, particularly post fight when he has to school me and remind me that I'm trying to be slick with my college educated self. I love it. I'm talking about the great Teddy Atlas. He's on the line with yours truly right now. What's up, buddy? How you doing, man? Hey, Stephen. How are you? I'm doing great. It's always good to talk to you. Talk to me about this fight coming up Saturday night. Errol Spence Jr. against uh, L- Lamont Peterson on Showtime. Your thoughts about that? I mean, for me, Spence is a monster. He's a beast. My son works for the Oakland Raiders, and he uses uh, that kind of verbiage over there in the NFL. They, okay. When they want to compliment somebody, the guy's a beast. And for me, the best way I could compliment Spence, usually I say things that are a little bit more complex sometimes, but um, it gets it gets right to the point. He's a beast and a smart beast. See, when I train fighters, sometimes I say like to Timothy Bradley, I say, look, we're going to be a monster in this fight, but we're going to be a smart monster. He's a smart monster. He's technically solid. He was an Olympian. Uh, he fought the best in the world in the Olympics internationally. Uh, so he knows he belongs at that level. He learned how to fight. He's a southpaw on top of it. He's physically so strong. I don't know how he makes well to wait. He's a big, strong guy. But most importantly, he's got that attitude. He's got attitude that I'm going to get you. You know, I'm going to get you. And you are not going to stop me. I remember years ago, Customano, my mentor used to tell me, very few people get supreme confidence. Very few. The only two he ever saw that he thought had it was Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Robinson. And I, I think that I've seen certain guys that come very close to that supreme confidence. And Spence might be one of those guys. That really means in supreme confidence that... I don't think you can lose. I don't think I can lose. I don't think there's any way that I will not find a way, no matter what it takes, to win this fight. And having said that, he's fighting a guy in Peterson who's a solid guy. He's a solid guy. His MO is a little similar to Spence. You know, he likes to go after you. He likes to press the action. He likes to go downstairs, you know, to the basement. But the only difference is he's doing it with a guy who does all those things much, much better at a much higher level. Spence goes downstairs to the body. That That's his forte. That You know, that's what he all loves right. to do. But he doesn't just go downstairs. He takes over the whole floor. I mean, so at the end of the day, I see Spence, even with a solid – Peters in front of him. I see Spence getting him out of there. Well, let me ask you this, Teddy. Has he really, uh, Errol Spence Jr., I love him. He's my favorite right now, I, him and Terrence Crawford. But I got to ask you, has he really been tested? Because even though he beat Kell Brook, that was after Kell Brook got softened up, particularly his eye socket against Triple G. He fought Triple G before he fought Errol Spence Jr. I thought if he had, had he fought Errol Spence Jr., before the Triple G fight, had he had had Kell Brook never had the Triple G fight, then I think Errol Spence Jr. might have had a toughest a tougher matchup against him. What do you say to that? There's my college friend with that college <laughs> wit. There he is. Yeah, of course you're going to come with the right question. Look, has he been completely, completely tested? In my eyes, very close. If if not completely, very close. Not just in a Brook fight, which you're right, he got damaged. He got softened up against Golovkin, no doubt about it. But he was he's still a big welterweight. He's a solid welterweight. Before that, he was undefeated. He was fighting in his home country. You fight in your home country. You have a lot more going for you. You have a whole country you don't want to let down. That is not an easy task for anybody. But there's a guy with 200, 250 amateur fights. He fought the best in the world. He fought some of these guys that are world champions now when they were amateurs. You still beating really good fighters, even though they're only three-round fights. So in that way, I believe what I see. I believe what I'm getting and spent. I believe he's everything that I said the first five minutes of this interview. And I believe that he is in the most talented weight class there is, the most competitive talented in boxing right now, the welterweight class. I mean, that welterweight class is no joke. I mean, you got guys like Thurman, you got you got Danny Garcia, you got Crawford, who you just said. Yep. I mean, you you have a weight class there that is so, so full. I, I know there's somebody I'm missing 
Right now, you got Thurman, you got Spence. Yeah, yeah Sean got, Porter. Sean Porter's tough. You he's got tough. Sean Porter. Porter. He's he's a little bit below those guys. Yeah, but, but he's tough. He's a, he's a tough guy. He's a load. He's a guy that brings it all the time. Well, and and in Thurman, I mean, you might have the best athlete in boxing. Well, I mean, well, he's a right really there. athletic stay, guy. Stay, stay right there. Inside outside. Teddy, stay right there with Keith Thurman. We're talking to the great Teddy Atlas, box, boxing analyst extraordinaire, right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. I spoke to Errol Spence on first take yesterday. He's about to come on his radio show after I hang up with you. This man sets up there and he says, Keith Thurman, he thinks Keith Thurman is trying to duck him. That's who he really, really wants. Is that just hyperbole? Is that just talking because you're trying to coax him into the big money fight? Or do you believe that Keith Thurman may be avoiding Errol Spence Jr.? See, that's a good question. I think that Thurman is a smart guy. If you're going to be a champion, you're going to be a guy that that Stephen A. and Teddy Allen is going to spend time talking about. You know what? You've got to be more than just that beast. Like I said before, you've got to be a smart monster. He's a smart guy. He's not going to take that fight now until it's big enough, until the money's there, until everything else is out of the way, and that's the last option, and it's the right option. Of course. So in that way, if, does that answer your question? Does that mean he's ducking him? Yeah, maybe he is ducking him. Does that mean he's afraid of him? No, not in well, that way. It just means that it does not make any sense for Keith Thurman right well, now, undefeated Keith Thurman right now, to be fighting a guy like Spence. Well, let me tell you why I think it makes sense to me, Teddy. Keith Thurman has already fought Danny Garcia. He's already fought Sean Porter. So what I'm saying is, who else is left out there for Keith Thurman to fight? That's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, you know what? In his mind, as good as these guys are, they can still, it's kind of like as good as that steak is, they could still use a couple minutes on a barbecue, on a stove. They could just use a couple more minutes. And that's how he's thinking of it. He's thinking, you know, Spence is terrific. I know how good he is. I know what I have to deal with. But let him get a little bigger. Let him win this fight. Let him win another fight. Let him get a little bit bigger. And then also... He's coming off shoulder surgery. Let me, and that being Thurman, obviously, let me get another fight. Let me make another payday, and let's put this down the road a little bit, a little bit. Teddy Atlas right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. One of my last questions coming up. Terrence Crawford obviously is considered one of the best pound-for-pound fighters, if not the best pound-for-pound fighter in the world, even though some people would say Lomachenko is that dude. But you look at Terrence Crawford, he's absolutely sensational. He has decided to move up from the junior welterweight division to this division with Errol Spence Jr. He's going to fight Joe Horn. Everybody's expecting him to beat the Australian. And then after that, he sat up there and told me, Keith Thurman, Errol Spence Jr., Either one of them is fine with him. How do you believe Terrence Crawford is going to do on the elevated level of going up seven pounds to the welterweight division? And how soon do you think he'll end up fighting Thurman or Errol Spence Jr.? Well, yes, it's the right way because it's it's attached to weight. You know, the only the only way that he doesn't have his way at the next division the way he did at the last division because he is that good. There's no doubt about it. The, his skill sets are there and his mind is there. You know, he's a guy who's reliable, he's consistent, he's mentally tough, he's been tested. So the only way that he doesn't get to that place and dominate the welterweights the way he did below that is size. Is that these guys, because they're really good and they're bigger. You know, that, that would be a hell of a fight to see Crawford on the outside trying to keep Spence from coming in, trying to see him, keep him from eating up real estate and eating him up next, right after that real estate, being able to counter punch him, nail him big shots because he's a big puncher, being able to do all of that before he gets close to him. That would be a hell of a fight. Matter of fact, I know your main sport, I mean, you're good at everything, but your main sport is the NBA. For me, comparing Crawford and Spence that's kind of like going and comparing LeBron James and Kevin Durant. It really is, because LeBron James would, of course, be spent. Physical, a physical monster. And obviously, he has the skill set. Kevin Durant, longer, taller, faster, more slick. That's what you would be getting. You would be getting LeBron James, and you would be getting Kevin Durant. Who's better one-on-one? Teddy Atlas, I got to put you on the spot here, sir. Because based on your synopsis, based on based on your breakdown, you seem to believe that Errol Spence Jr. and Terrence Crawford are on an elevated level over Keith Thurman. Am I reading that correctly? No, it's just the inactivity. I mean, I I really like Thurman. I think he's the 
probably the most athletic guy, pure athletic guy, inside, outside, legs. He could do all those things. These guys could do one thing or the other, but not as well, not, and not quite as versatile as, as Keith Thurman. I think he's the most athletic guy there is right now. The only thing about him, I mentioned it earlier, he's really smart. I mean, all these guys are smart in different ways, but he's really smart. I wonder how much he's dedicated to staying in this sport. That's the only thing that hits me a little bit when I look at him is how that he's made money already, you know, in a, in a short period of time. He's accomplished a lot in a short period of time. He's got a lot in front of him if he wants to. But how dedicated to the grind of the sport, to really, really the legacy, being the best in boxing, going through all the blood, sweat, and tears that's still in front of him, all the pain that's still in front of him. How dedicated is he really to that? I'm not right. positive. I'll close it by saying this. I think Errol Spence would beat Keith Thurman, and I think Terrence Crawford, my only reservation about him is whether or not he'd be too small. But skill-wise, I think he's better than Thurman. I like Thurman a lot, but I don't think he's these two. Thanks a lot, Teddy. I appreciate you, buddy, as always. Thanks so much. My pleasure, Stephen. All right. The one and only Teddy Atlas right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio, 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. That was the premier boxing analyst extraordinaire that he is, the one and only Teddy Atlas of ESPN. Up next is the welterweight, the IBF welterweight champion of the world who fights this Saturday night on Showtime Boxing. His name is Errol Spence Jr. He's a bad somebody. And he's up next with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here on ESPN Radio. Let me get right to it. Last May 27th in Sheffield, England, this man went to the hometown of Kell Brook and via an 11th round KO captured the IBF welterweight championship of the world. He is the IBF welterweight champion of the world. He is getting set to defend his crown this Saturday night at the Barclays Center in New York City, Brooklyn, New York, against Lamont Peterson. The one and only Errol Spence Jr. What's going on, man? How are you? Hey, not much, man. Just getting ready. All right, you're on this media tour, man, and you're doing a lot of interviews and what have you. I want to make sure you're careful because you don't need to be tired Saturday night. You're going to be ready, right? Oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to be ready. Um, I had some interviews to do this morning, but I'm canceling them. Well, I pre- you know, it's time, it's, it's time to get focused. I feel you on that. Uh, how? What, what are you expecting this fight Saturday night? What are you predicting? Um, I'm expecting Lamont Peterson to come and shave like he always does and, um, you know, try to bring the fight to me. And, um, you know, I'm predicting a, you know, one-sided, you know, great performance by myself in a W, of course. When you think about your skill set and what you bring to the table, you're 22 and 0, you got 19 knockouts. When you look at yourself right now, some people ask you, do you compare yourself to Floyd Money Mayweather, who you've sparred against, worked out with, I assume. Uh, but, but I want to know what kind of fighter, when you look throughout the annals of boxing history and you think about the great fighters that have fought in this sport, who do you model yourself after? Oh, um, I think I model myself after guys like, you know, Ray Leonard, uh, Terry Norris. Um, uh, Gerald McCullum, um, you know, Vernon Forrest, mm-hmm. you know, just to name a few. I like all of those names, but you said Terry Norris. And even though I like Terry Norris, Terry Norris, cause he used to put people to sleep. I remember what, what Simon Brown to it, it, it did to him. <laughs> I mean, you, you didn't think, you didn't think I forgot about that one, did you? I mean, come on now. He had, he did have a questionable jaw. Would it just, that is not you. Um, I mean, he had a question with job, but he got knocked out by big power punches. I mean, he got knocked out by Julian Jackson, and yep. um, you didn't you didn't say what he did the second fight against Simon Brown. That's true, though. He beat Simon Brown by decision, gave him a boxing lesson, took him to school. I remember when he knocked out John the Beast Mugabe. Trust me, I know enough about Terry Norris. Make no mistake about it. But let me get back to you. We're talking to Errol Smith Jr. right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio because right now, when we see some of the great, great boxers in the game, the Triple G's, the Canelo Alvarez's, others, you know, pound for pound wise, where do you put yourself right now? Um. Right now, I think I'm in the top five. Um, you know, I'm definitely not with number one. It's still a lot. Um, I know that this year that I am, you know, one of the best time-time fighters out there right now. 
Now, everybody's looking at Lamont Peterson as essentially a tune-up. We got Terrence Crawford moving up to the welterweight division after dominating at the junior welterweight spot. We've got guys like Keith Thurman, Danny Garcia, Sean Porter, and others in the welterweight division. Who's on your hit list? Who do you really, really want badly? I mean, everybody's on my hit list. I mean, Lamont Peterson, he's not – I mean, I don't consider him as a tune-up fighter at all. I mean, Lamont Peterson is a top-rated welterweight. He's a guy that – you know, always comes to fight and always in tough close fights. I mean, it's arguably he could arguably he won that fight against Danny Garcia. I mean, you ask people. So, I mean, he's a tough fighter, but I want to unify the bill. So, not looking past this fight. I want to get, you know, Keith Thurman in the ring and, uh, and unify the bill. Do you feel anybody out there is ducking you? Um, I mean, it's a lot of fighters out there that I think that that's avoiding me. You know, I don't like to use the word ducking, you know, but there are they are fighters out there that's avoiding me. A lot of the top West ways are avoiding me. Have you concerned yourself with the fact that in some people's eyes you looked so great? Why would anybody want to risk their careers by fighting you a bit too early? As a result of that, you may not get the fights that you're in search of. Have you concerned yourself with that at all? <laughs> I mean, that may that may be the fans, the fans, um, you know, perspective. But I feel like as a fighter, you know, I mean, that's your mentality should be different from from a fan mentality or a spectator mentality. Mm-hmm. As a fighter, your your whole you know mentality should be like, I want to fight the best, I want to beat the best. Oh, this guy ha- has a belt, you know, I'm gonna try to take this belt from him. You know, recently when I spoke to when I spoke to Terrence Crawford, and we're talking to Errol Spence Jr., the IBF welterweight champion of the world, looking to unify the belts. He loved uh, Keith Thurman, which is something that he told me just a few days ago. But somebody else on the come up is one of the greatest in the world himself right now, Terrence Crawford. He was just a junior welterweight. He's moving up those seven pounds. He's got to handle business against Joe Horn. But then he says he wants you or Keith Thurman. What do you say to that? Um. I like his mentality. That's what he supposed to want. And, um, you know, it's something that we definitely make it happen, especially, you know, with the guys in the suit, you know, go and talk about it and uh, try to get that fight made. I mean, he's across he's across the street, and I'm on the other side of the street, so that's something the guys in the suits got to discuss, and, you know, that goes past us just wanting to fight. Real quickly, one of the things that I just finished talking to Teddy Atlas about, boxing analyst extraordinaire for ESPN, I just finished talking to him about this. He was talking about, you know, your skill set and what you bring to the table. He said you're a monster. You're a smart monster. You bring a lot to the table and what have you. And he thinks that you could do a lot, but he was he was expressing surprise at your ability to stay at the welterweight division. Is it tough for you to stay at 147, or is that something that comes relatively easy for you? Um, I wouldn't say it's easy. It just takes it, – it's a lot of discipline. I mean, it's a lot of discipline and, um, you know, basically staying on top of your your, um, your diet and, and your weight. I mean, I woke up today only a pound over. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm not going to say I make it easy, but, you know, I just stay disciplined and stay to my food regimen. And um, it, is, it, it, gets, it is mentally taxing because you want to eat certain things and, right. you know, people around you might – be eating something and you can't eat that. So, I mean, it is it is hard mentally, but I mean, as long as I say discipline, I can make this weight for at least four or five more years. Yeah, because I was getting ready to ask: Is that your way of saying that you know what? Two, three big fights at the at this weight at the welterweight spot at one forty seven, and then after that, you're going to move up to junior middleweight. Is that the vision that you have for the future, or all you focused on right now is handling your business in this division? Hello? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's something I would do. Um, okay. You know, if, if, if something presented itself where, I, you know, I could fight for a title at 154, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'll do that. I mean, if it was, um, it was a, it, it's an interest to me, but um, it's not something that I'm rushing at all. I got you. I mean, it's a lot of guys at 47 that still, my dream to be on the at 147, so that's my main focus. Last question to you. What's your prediction for Saturday night? We want to hear a prediction. Oh, my prediction for Saturday night is me getting my hand raised and, uh, you know, great one-sided performance. But my is going to put up a great fight. But I feel like you have the skills and the ability to negate anything that he does and, um, you know, put on a great show and a great performance for the fans. 
Errol Spence Jr., the reigning defending IBF welterweight champion of the world, going up against Lamont Peterson Saturday night at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn on Showtime. Don't miss it. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate your time. Good luck this Saturday night, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Cowboy Nation. Oh, Lord, you're a Cowboys fan. I forgot <laughs> you were from Dallas, Texas. Oh, you, you, you just, I, I, and I got love for you, and that's what you're going to do to me. <laughs> Mention the Cowboys on this show. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and, and you know what? They, they, sh- they shouldn't even be represented with, by you. You know that, right? Because you're a winner. You're a winner. <laughs> you can't say that about hey. the Cowboys. Hey, we'll be back to our glory day soon, man. Are you ready for this analogy for me to give this to you before I let you go? Right, you are twenty. You are twenty two and zero. It's been twenty two <laughs> years since the Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl. <laughs> Take it easy, man. We'll be back. You're whatever. Right. You're Ben said they ain't saying that since you were born. Yeah, we'll be back. <laughs> Goodbye, man. Errol Smith Jr., IBF welterweight champion of the world. He's a bad somebody, y'all. Make no mistake about it. Lamont Peterson. Good luck, my brother. Good luck. You will need it. Your calls to close out the show in a minute with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Dollar Shave Club not only gives you an amazing shave, but they also make products for your hair, your face, your skin, shower, everything you need. And it's all their own original stuff. Dollar Shave Club has you covered head to toe. And right now, you can get your first month of their best razor along with travel size versions of shave butter, body cleanser, and yes, even butt wipes. That's right, I said it. Butt wipes for just $5. After that, replacement cartridges ship for just a few bucks a month. It's the DSC starter set for just $5. Exclusively at dollarshaveclub.com slash Stephen A. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash Stephen A. That's with a PH, not a V. We'll get into Mel Kuyper Jr.'s uh, mock draft a little bit more tomorrow as we preview the AFC and NFC Championship games get set, getting set for this weekend. But until then, we'll go to the phones real quick uh, before we get on out of here for the day. Let's go to Lawrence in Texas. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Lawrence? How are you? Hey, Stephen A. Um, I just wanted to uh, hit on what you were talking about with the NBA. Go ahead. Uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, I'm a Hispanic male myself, and I, I know what it's like being racially profiled and stuff. But uh, there is a... a, a difference between that and hockey and baseball you know it's okay for them to you know hash it out and you know they, they set a different standard in there you know and and it also has to do with the broadcasters you know they seem to make it sound like you know let them hash it out in hockey and baseball you know it's, it's like it's okay for them to do it but when it comes to basketball it's like the broadcaster, even the broadcasters in basketball, they say, no, it's, it's bad. You know, don't let them do that. You know, I got you. A bunch of thugs I got you. And, I, don't, you know? I don't have the time to get into all of that, but I hear you, and you're not totally wrong. But I appreciate the call. Thank you. John in Manhattan, you're live with Stephen A. Go ahead. Hey, Stephen, how you doing? Well, getting back with the NBA refs, I just think they're trying to influence the show, like be part of the show. And I, it's like in Major League Baseball, like for a while they were throwing out players every night. But it, it, it's bad for the game, though. I mean, it's, it, 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 it's the, like you said, the thing is um, the fans are paying to see the, see the stars play, and then they, when they get thrown out, it, it wrecks the game. Yeah, it does. I, I don't want to say it wrecks the game, but I think it's selling the image of the players. I think it's contributing to the negativity that is aimed towards players, you know, from critics who want to label them thuggish or beyond. I think the NBA officials need to get on board. It doesn't mean that you give them a pass or you absolve them from bad behavior. But at the same time, my God, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Russell Westbrook, Steph Curry, these are people we pay to see. You're throwing them out of games? You're giving Courtney Lee a tech for talking to a player. He didn't even say anything to you as the official. That's a problem. It really is. Freddie in Indiana, you got 30 seconds. Go. Hey, Stephen. Hey, hey, I just wanted to get two things. You got 30 the NBA, seconds. Go. The, the NBA is turning. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a smaller league now, but it's not Isaiah Thomas small. He's a special talent. We know, we know what he brings to the table. But small for me in the NBA is six two and up, and then a small center was six nine six ten. I told you you got to say thirty seconds. That's the point you wanted to make that he's not really that small. Way too small to send a team to win, to send a team to win. And 
uh, at the end of his career, I don't think no team will retire Isaiah Thomas's jersey. I got you. I appreciate the call. Thank you so much. It's not about retiring his jersey. That was a very weak call. It's about whether or not he deserved a video tribute after two years and 21 games in Boston. That's what the issue was. Very weak call on your part. Do better next time. Do better. I'll talk to y'all in 22 hours from now. AFC NFC Championship game. More Stephen A. tomorrow. Peace and love. That's just a